It's one o'clock right now, so we're going to get started with the meeting. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the first working group meeting of the Wellington Circle Study. My name is Michaela Niles and I'm the MassDOT project manager for this effort. We would first like to note that this meeting is being recorded and we're excited to begin the study process and appreciate you taking the time out for this study effort. Before jumping into some of the rules and regulations, I believe the mayor was going to say a word, few words to kick off the study process. There may be some technical difficulties. Um, so once the mayor arrives, we'll return for a few um, welcoming remarks. Um, so again, welcome everyone to our first working group meeting of the Wellington Circle study. Due to the use of this new virtual platform, we're gonna start by reviewing a few of the ground rules. So Natalie from our consultant team will walk through these to help us operate as efficiently and effectively as possible. Natalie? Oh, you're muted, Natalie. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, like Michaela said, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, you may choose to keep your video on or off. Uh, we just ask that you, to minimize distractions, um, keep it off if something's going on in the background. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, whether it's audio or video, you can email Leah Epstein on our project team. Uh, her email's on the screen. It's lepstein at hntb.com. Um, and as working group members, you will be able to participate in designated discussion periods and times for questions and comments. Uh, we ask that you use the raise hand feature in Zoom so that we can manage the conversation. You can find this by um, clicking the bottom of your screen, the participants button, and then a panel will pop up. And on the bottom right-hand side of that panel, there'll be a raise hand button. If you're joining from a mobile device, uh, you may see three dots and you would have to click that to access raise hand. And if you're joining us from a telephone, you would press star nine in order to raise your hand. Uh, if you're joining us from the public today, there is a Q&A button um, on the bottom of the Zoom panel, and you can use that at any time to submit questions or comments in writing. And those will be addressed by the project team following the presentation as time allows. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Michaela to uh, continue on with the agenda. So I'm gonna hand it off to Mayor Lungo Cohn, who has joined us here today. Mayor? Um, if you'd like to say a few words as we kick off the study process. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. No, I just want to say good afternoon to everybody and thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you to MassDOT for leading this effort and for coordinating today's kickoff meeting and for inviting me to join you for this initial discussion. I think we all know that improvements are needed at Wellington Circle and in the surrounding areas but being such a large and busy intersection with many important connections, it's important that the planning and implementation are given the appropriate time and considerations across, across all modes of transportation. I'm looking forward to the ideas and discussions that stem from this working group. And I know with so many stakeholders represented here, there will be a lot of considerations and advice to take in with the needs and ideas of all residents and businesses incorporated. We've had to adapt to a lot of new schedules and planning this year, and I know that fitting in another project may not be easy, but I really wanna thank each of you for volunteering for this project and for helping to make our community safer and more accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We appreciate you joining us today. And for today's agenda, we'll have introductions of the study team and the working group, as well as talk about the role of the working group. Then we'll cover the study background and process, then Gary McNaughton, project manager for the consultant team, will talk about the initial study areas, goals and objectives, and evaluation criteria. At that time, we'll pause and ask for any clarification questions from the working group before we have a larger discussion of the items Gary will be presenting on today. Then I'll talk a little bit about the study schedule and next steps. So, 
for this planning effort, we've kind of assembled the Avengers of planning studies. And here today we have Ethan Britland, uh, co-project manager from MassDOT. From the consultant team, we have Gary McNaughton, Natalie, who you've met a little bit earlier today. We have Joanne Harris and Jordan Van Emmerich from McMahon Associates, as well as Leah Epstein and Erica Blonde from HNTB. Next slide, please. So for this study, we've put together a group of regional, federal, state, and local representatives to participate in the working group. And so at this time, I'll go down the participants list and have each of the working group members here in attendance today introduce themselves and who they're representing. So we'll start with Andy. Andy Paul, you're now unmuted. Okay, we'll um, circle back to Andy. Um, next we have Bill Carlson. You're now unmuted. Uh, I'm a member of the board of Park Lake Plaza South Condominium and a member of the 9th Street Traffic Coalition. My master's in transportation planning is from the MIT Operations Research Center. Thank you, Bill. We also have Brad here today, today on the call. Brad, you're now unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brad Rawson. I serve the great city of Somerville as Director of Mobility in Mayor Joe Curtitoni's Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. I'm here representing Mayor Joe, and we just want to give a big shout out and lots of credit to our state agency partners at MassDOT, um, at the Department of Conservation and Recreation, regional partners like the MBTA and so many others as well as our neighboring municipalities. Our program in Somerville really is rooted in regionalism. And we know that we cannot unwind the systemic inequities and uh, sustainability challenges that we are faced with without a regional coalition of partners. So we're delighted to be here with the city of Medford and with all of you and look forward to doing the work together. Thanks, Brad. Next we have Sergeant Hartnett. You're now unmuted. How are you doing, Sergeant Charlie Hartnett? I'm the uh, officer in charge of the Medford Police Department Traffic Unit. Thank you, Sergeant. Next, we have Representative Barber on the line. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Barber. I'm one of the state representatives for Medford and really excited about this process and really um, ensuring that everyone's needs are met in this region. So thank you all for, for joining today. Thank you. Next we have Connie. I am Connie Raphael from the MassDOT Highway Division District Board Office. Hi Connie. Hey. Next we have Doug Carr. <clears throat> yes, um, I'm representing the uh, NAACP. We have, that's the Mystic Valley branch that represents uh, Medford, Malden, Uber, and Everett, Arlington, and Winchester. Uh, obviously, the Wellington Circle is uh, in Medford, but it's a regional uh, challenge, obviously. So it's really important that transportation is, is uh, respected in all forms. Uh, and we're trying to obviously improve a very tough situation right now. Thank you, Doug. Next, we have Fang Young. You're now unmuted. Oh, okay. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, though. This is Huang Yunxi, and you can call me Fang, and I'm coming from uh, Master Transportation uh, Safety Review Group. So I'm going to help with uh, figure out the potential safety issue and try to figure out the way to increase, not increase, to, to decrease the traffic crash like sort of staff. So I'm happy to join the team. 
Thank you. Next we have Jay, Jay Campbell. Hi, my name is Jay Campbell. I'm a resident of Medford. I'm also uh, on the board of directors of the Medford Chamber of Commerce, and I own a property management company based in Medford, serving the area. Hello. Next, we have Jeff Buxbaum. Hi, I'm Jeff Buxbaum. I'm representing Walk Medford, Wellington Circle, walking. Yeah, that's why I'm here. So, um, so hopefully be able to come up with something that makes something better. Welcome, Jeff. Next, we have Jeff Parenti. Hello, I'm Michaela. Hello. I'm Jeff Parenti, Deputy Chief Engineer for the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the State Parks Agency. In the study area, DCR owns Fells Way north of the intersection and McDonald Park on the southwest corner of the intersection. Hello, Jeff. Next, we have Julie. My name is Julie Wormser. I'm PD Director of the Mystic River Watershed Association. Um, we are very interested in bike and pedestrian access all throughout uh, the river on uh, McDonald Park. I separately was almost killed by a truck in this uh, intersection, so have some pro tips on, uh, <laughs> on traffic safety, I guess. Welcome, Julie. Next, we have Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa Schlesbaum, Assistant State Traffic Engineer with MassDOT. Hello, Lisa. Next, we have Matthew Hartman. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Hartman. I'm Chief of Staff for Senator Pat Jalen, who may be attending some of these meetings in the future, uh, but uh, she represents Somerville and Cambridge in their entirety and is very familiar with all the problems of this intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Olivia Murphy. Can you hear me? Hi. I am um, new to the highway design for Mass DOT, and I'm just listening in. Um, Andy Paul just did it. Thank you and welcome. Next, we have Todd Blake. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd Blake, the City of Medford Transportation Engineer. Um, I'm eager to start this process. Thank you for having me, and uh, thanks to MassDOT and everyone else. Thank you. And next, we have Yuri. Hi, uh, my name is Yuri um, Boyko. I'm the executive director of Bike to the Sea, um, a biking and walking uh, adequ adequacy group, and I'm also a Medford resident. Happy to be here. Welcome. And next we have Jay Monty. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jay Monty. I'm representing Mayor Di Maria from the city of Everett. I'm the uh, director of transportation here for the city. Welcome. Next, we have Melissa. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Joulet. I work for the MBTA, where I'm the senior director of service planning. Uh, so I look at a lot of bus routing and scheduling. Um, but I also coordinate with a lot of the other operations groups. And then also, as it happens, I live in Somerville, so I'm very familiar with biking and walking and paddling and, and driving in the area. So that's my background. Thank you, Melissa. And next we have Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Timoner. I'm the MassDOT District 4 Traffic Engineer. Welcome, Sarah. So as you've heard, um, and a, we have a diverse group of people on our working group. And with these uh, diverse perspectives, we will then transition over to the role of the working group. 
So we ask for a working member for our working group members to share your perspectives and expertise with the study team and with your fellow working group members. We also want this process to be a knowledge exchange. So we ask that group members share the information that's presented at these meetings with the organizations that you represent, which leads to the next role of the working group, which is to review the information that's presented, have those conversations with your colleagues, and provide us with your feedback on the materials. Next slide, please. So next we're going to talk a little bit about the background and process. So to provide a bit of background information on the study, this effort was launched as part of the Section 61 finding for the Encore Boston Harbor Casino. And as part of that finding, funds were allocated for a study to look at long-term improvements at Wellington Circle. Next slide, please. So with that charge in mind, this conceptual planning study will look at the current and future conditions in the area and examine and develop recommendations that are aimed at reconfiguring the circle to better provide local and regional connectivity. And the recommendations that are developed through this study process will then be included in a final report. Next slide, please. And in terms of how we get there to the final report, we have study tasks that build upon each other with tasks one and two really being the foundation of the study. So the working group will meet based on the deliverables at these study milestones. So here today we're discussing task one, then the next step will be an analysis of the existing and future conditions, as well as a look at the issues within the study area. And with this analysis and with your input, alternatives will be developed and assessed by looking at a variety of areas, including mobility, safety, and environmental impacts. And with those findings, those will help us inform the recommendations that will then be included in a draft, then final report. Next slide, please. So one of the foundational elements of this effort is public participation. And so for this study, we have eight working group meetings, four public meetings, and if and when possible, for pop-up community events. Next slide, please. So with our current environment, we'll definitely be leaning heavily on um, online engagement, rather. So we have the MassDOT webpage, which will house study information and meeting materials, as well as links to our online engagement platform, Pima. And through Pima, we have a comment form that will be open throughout the study process, and we encourage everyone to sign up for study updates through Pima as well. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Gary. Oh, there we go. I clicked on mute a second ago, hoping it would get up there in time, so almost made it. Um, so again, I'm Gary McNaughton with McMahon Associates, the project manager for the team. I don't know if that makes me Captain America or Iron Man. <laughs> um, as we start to look at this project we, in the study area itself, the study area on this project has multiple layers to it, depending on what we're looking at. Um, if you go to the next slide. So we have the local study area, which is going to be the intense, you know, look at vehicle operations, you know, pedestrian, bicycle, bus accommodations through air, how people are traveling through this local area. And, you know, if you've been involved in a study like this, this will be the analysis that you've seen before where we're looking at level of service criteria, we're looking at, you know, inventories of pet and bike accommodations, ways we can improve those, how those various modes interact, you know, on the local level. Um, you know, folks, if you've ever been involved with a project that, that I've been presenting on, you know, and, and I always joke, this will get me kicked out of the traffic engineers club, but I'm not a big fan of level of service in an inner, in a, you know, an urban intersection, um, you know, level of service tends to overstate the operations and make things sound a lot worse than they are. Um, and we'll start to look at different metrics through this and uh, with travel time and queuing and ultimately get to some modeling uh, when we start talking about alternatives on the local level and we'll be able to illustrate exactly how those would function and how they'll operate for all modes. Next slide. When we step back, there's a regional element to the study as well. As we all talked, you know, there's, there's regional influences on Wellington Circle and Wellington will have an influence on those regional roadways. And when you start to look at making changes 
in Wellington, how is that going to affect the regional network and vice versa? If there's changes in the regional network and, and projects that are happening, how is that going to change travel patterns through Wellington Circle? And we'll be working with CTPS and their model, which covers pretty much all of Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be studying that area, but we'll be using that model for the basis to assess how travel patterns will change, what travel patterns will look like in the future with the different scenarios that we'd be looking at. Uh, we're also in kind of a unique circumstance here with the, the COVID um, influences on travel patterns. You know, there's a lot of speculation on how those look longer term. We'll know more about that as this study progresses, but you know, as, as of now, we're going to be looking at the traditional projections starting with 2019 volumes as kind of our existing conditions and then looking out to the current projections for future years. But keeping an eye towards, you know, how are things playing out as, as hopefully things start to pick back up to resume normal life over the course of this project and what kind of effect that may have to really inform us. It doesn't mean we'll necessarily get into a lot of analysis of those different scenarios, but at least have that within the context of what we're looking at for the project. When we start to look at the goals of the project, this is where we want to hear from you. Um, you know, when we tackle a project like this, we, you know, you look at Wellington Circle as an engineer and, you know, it's kind of one of those dream areas of, I know I can come up with something better than what's on the ground there. And you really want to dive right in and start to solve the problem. And we, we make a conscious effort to resist that temptation and really wait until we have input uh, from the working group, from the public. You know, it's great that we have diverse representation here. Um, so we can hear how everybody's using the circle. What do you want out of it? Is it, you know, pedestrian accommodations and access? Is it facilitating economic development? You know, is it access to Wellington Station? Uh, is it all of the above? Uh, and hearing from you folks on what those goals are. So the study has a draft set of goals um, that are outlined and you see them on screen related to mobility, safety, you know, quality of life and that um, economic development, you know, the business support uh, aspects of the project. And there's gonna be a lot of objectives that I'll start to touch on, but th these are the areas we wanna hear from you. We want you to kind of craft for us what's important. What are you looking for? out of the project and how can we come up with alternatives and ideas that can help accomplish the, the greatest number of goals possible. Um, recognizing that there may be trade-offs, there may be competing goals, but we'll certainly take that into consideration and evaluate that as we start to work through the project. So as you start to look at the individual goals and the objectives underneath them, uh, there are a draft set, you know, this will be available to you after. You don't have to completely respond uh, on the fly here. We will have a moment to talk about them. But again, these are the areas where we want you to, to weigh in. If you go to the next slide. Uh, when we start to look at the mobility goal, um, you know, there's the traffic congestion element to it. That's kind of the, the obvious traditional one. But then looking at pedestrians, bicycles, oh, one too many. Um, looking at pedestrian and bicycle conf, um, accommodations and transit users. Can we look at making those connections better? Can we improve reliability for transit through the area? Are there dedicated facilities for transit? Um, you know, those of you that have been in and around Boston, you're seeing more and more dedicated bus lanes coming up and, and other improvements to improve uh, transit use, particularly for those users that are dependent on bus systems and other transit. Uh, so are there ways we can improve that connectivity and making that connection to Wellington Station as well as other local destinations um, in the area for pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, bicyclists and certainly for you know, vehicles as well. Uh, now you can go on to the next slide. Um, when we look at the safety element of it, um, I know we had at least one working group member that has had um, an experience that probably is referred to as not being very safe out there and you know when you look at that the intersection and the accommodations and the crossing that's needed for pedestrians and bicyclists bicyclists you can see a lot of opportunity for improving safety reducing those conflict points uh, and trying to provide some dedicated space where it's not just a safer but a more enjoyable experience going through the circle uh, when you go on to the the quality of life goals next go next slide um, looking for opportunities to improve the the, the overall 
aesthetics of the circle. Um, you know, we, we anticipate that there may be opportunities to reconfigure roadways that may open up areas for open space for other uses for landscaping, uh, things like that. Um, some of those can also have public health and environmental impact benefits, uh, not just impacts. You know, certainly moving pedestrians and bicyclists further away from tailpipes of cars uh, may be something that we can accomplish uh, improving or decreasing impervious, impervious area and making sure that everything we're doing is fair and equitable for the EJ populations in the area. When we start to look at um, the, the connectivity for businesses and future development, you know, we want to be able to make sure that folks, you know, this isn't an area that you dread going to, that you're unwilling to, to travel to. You know, if there's a, an attractive destination that we want you to be able to get there, get there comfortably, uh, and look at ways that within the alternatives we can improve some of that access. Um, you know, and, and access between uses, not just that you feel like you're isolated on an island and that circle becomes a barrier where you never want to cross it uh, unless it absolutely hurt, absolutely have to. And we've heard that from folks that work in the area that I just won't go across the circle to go get lunch um, or run an errand. And we really want to try to break down some of those barriers where we can so that folks can, can travel through here and, and make it a more vibrant and uh, more thriving area. And a lot of that may come down to, tra to active transportation. Uh, being able to walk and bike through the area may still end up being quicker uh, than driving and certainly can be more enjoyable if we can make it a more desirable area and attractive area to be in. So, <clears throat> next slide. So as we start to look at some of the evaluation criteria, you know, these are just examples. These are just kind of some of the ideas you know, our goal is going to be to have measurable goals that we can set, measurable criteria. We're not going to weight them. We don't, you know, because you, you'll never get to consensus on weighting. Everybody's going to have their own uh, opinion on what's most important. But we do want to have things that we can measure and we can evaluate the criteria, at least against each other for all the different um, criteria that we'll be coming up with for evaluating it. So that'll be something we'll certainly be spending time on as a group and looking at ways that we can uh, define those, make sure that we're including what's important to everybody. Uh, and again, having them be measurable at the end of the day so that we can you know, have a, a very clear evaluation of our alternatives um, at the end of this process as we come out with the preferred alternatives. With that, I'll pause. I know I, I went through a lot of information. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I believe it's just a quick pause for any clarifying questions. Now, I know Michaela ran through some stuff. If there's anybody that has any questions on any of the material that's been discussed at this point, now would be your opportunity. We'll, we'll certainly have a, a broader opportunity for discussion towards the end. Great. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, is there an opportunity to identify not just um, focus areas like intersections, but uh, destinations like the park nearby um, yes. at, for a deeper dive? Yeah, certainly the routes and the connectivity um, is going to be something that we're going to want your input on when, you know, another project that, that I worked on not too long ago was the Casey Arborway project, used to be the Casey Overpass. And, you know, one of the, the exercises we did was on the pedestrian level and, and specifically getting the working group to tell us, you know, what are the desirable connections? Where do you want to go when you're crossing this circle um, and, and drawing all those points of interest of, you know, if I'm in station landing, I'm in They want to get across to some open space area and uh, desire lines so that we can have those as part of the, the process. I think there's also a question. So there is a question uh, in the chat about. Yep, I just saw that. So the Route 28 bridge, I assume, are you talking to the east of here? I just want to make sure I'm talking about the right bridge. So I outlined, you, know, you saw in that graphic that we had a 
um, a number of intersections that were called out and specific road, you know, the roadways within them will also be evaluated. It's not just, uh, oh, I'm sorry, to the south, okay. Um, so it's not just the intersections that we're looking at, we'll be accessing the roadway. When you start to look to the south of the intersection and you know, we fully expect that we are going to be looking along that corridor, pre-COVID being out in the intersection, uh, you see that queue spilling all the way back and starting to have an influence on the circle. So that's certainly an area that we're gonna be looking at. Hey Gary and everyone, point of information. In the short term, Route 28 uh, bridge, we are going to be adding bike lanes. When I say we, it's Somerville and Medford collectively with MassDOT, but Somerville is spearheading it thanks to Brad Ross and those folks. So this does all tie in together eventually, but there are some short-term things going on that will tie in with the long-term. Yeah, and, and we're, you know, the graphics that we had on the study area, if you notice, they don't have hard edges. You know, we're, we're still in the process of defining exactly what the study area looks like to make sure that we do have a comprehensive look at you know what's influencing transportation through wellington circle and vice versa all right if there's no other questions at this point we'll move forward and we had some questions for you that natalie will steer us through yep thanks gary um so our first question is just trying to get your initial reaction to the draft goals that Gary just reviewed today. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll here. Um, so we're asking, what do you think of the draft goals as presented today? Looks like we have some initial results in. Um, the majority either saying they look great or overall uh, good, but minor revisions. Um, and we, it looks like the poll may have ended early if we want to, we could relaunch it if um, not everyone had had a chance to vote. All right, I'm going to relaunch because we didn't have uh, a large percentage of people voting in that one. So I'll leave this open for about 30 seconds. All right, it looks like it's still holding true with, they generally look good. There you know, certainly some revisions, some minor revisions, um, getting a lot of votes, which we'd expect. If we got that 100% perfect, we'd be surprised. Um, and like we said before, there will be discussion following these questions. Um, so if you want to expand on your answer, there will be time to do that. Um, and so the next three questions we have all pertain to the different objectives we can use to uh, incorporate into the goals to understand if a goal has been met or not. Um, so you're allowed to select multiple answers in this question, but we ask that you think about the trade-offs associated with uh, choosing one over the other and really try to focus on your most important priorities. Uh, so I'm just getting this poll up here. All right, so what are the most important aspects of improving mobility and access?
I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. All right. Well, it certainly looks like pedestrian and bicycle. Um, and it's interesting that vehicle traffic and traffic congestion being way down near the bottom. So interesting results there and certainly um, not surprising given the, you know, the challenges that walking and biking present in this area. I think Brad has a question. Uh, Mikhail and Natalie, if I can uh, just make a quick comment that hopefully is helpful for all of us as we go forward. I think that last poll is helpful and uh, based on Gary's you know, wisdom and the description of vehicular level of service when we started our meeting, I would hope that some of the shared learning that we engage in together helps illuminate the fact that those other four choices essentially advance a key performance indicator related to traffic mitigation. I would hope that we working together uh, are not in the classic dynamic of fighting for scraps of right away and thinking it's a binary choice between moving vehicles and moving people, but rather that investing proactively in a robust series of transit, walking, and biking connections throughout the study corridor help advance that key performance indicator of managing traffic congestion that we all care about deeply. Yeah, if I may add to that, um, I, I wanna echo what Brad said, and I would hope that everyone involved, including the residents and businesses, keep an open mind and, and think big here. This is an opportunity to throw every, every option on the table you know, and, um, and, and it is a truly a balancing act that we hope to you know, improve all modes, but uh, there will be some trade-offs and balancing to be had. Yeah, you noticed the final polling results, I guess mitigating traffic congestion made a little bit of a comeback there, but um, certainly the, the bike and pedestrian connection stayed well in the lead. So, um, you know, Brad, I know you've worked with me on other projects, so you know how we tend to approach these things. All right, so moving on uh, to our next polling question, uh, we have, what do you see as the most important safety issues? And again, you'll be allowed to select multiple issues. Leave it open for about 10 more seconds. All right. The complexity confusion in this intersection does not surprise me that that one would win. Um, as I said, this is not an intersection you would see in any traffic engineering textbook for sure. Um, but you know, you, you're also still seeing that, that leaning towards making sure bikes and peds are safe, um, going back with the conflict points and, and trying to re reduce those. I think the complexity and confusion of the intersection for drivers probably adds to some of the, the safety concerns for bicyclists and pedestrians as drivers are distracted with a lot of different inputs of trying to navigate the, the circle and you know, may not be able to pay as close attention to the, as they should for bike and pedestrian conflicts. All right, so we have one more question here. Um, what would make Wellington Circle more attractive for residents and businesses?
Looks like we have almost everyone voted. I'll leave it open a few more seconds. Great. Um, again, I think continuing on the theme, but you know, certainly the reduction in vehicle times and queuing falling way to the, the rear on this poll um, and, and the, that connectivity, you know, and again, just looking at the, the circle, that kind of the lack of connectivity there is really glaring and, and an obvious need. And I think this poll supports that. With that, I think we're going to turn it back to Michaela start to have some discussion engaging you folks a little bit more and us talking a little bit less. Thanks, Gary. So yes, we'll be opening up the uh, forum for discussion for the working group. So with all of those poll questions and your answers in mind, um, does anyone have any initial comments or thoughts? So I'll probably start with the first poll question. There were a few folks that um, had asked that or had mentioned that additional information would be helpful as goals are being developed. Um, does anyone want to speak to um, maybe some of the information that would be helpful? Uh, Michaela? Yes. Hi, could we actually go back to the slide with the goals so that we can all take a look at them? Michaela, I, I have a comment on, um, I agree with all these four goals. They're very good goals to try to achieve. Um, I'm not sure where this might fit into those maybe number one, but um, I hope that the group and the study is sensitive to local specific issues so that as we improve all these things, we don't cause something negative for someone else. For instance, Ninth Street and Brainerd Ave in Medford, uh, whenever there's issues at Wellington Circle, it potentially causes cut through issues for those local side streets. May I add on to what Todd just said? Um, I also think this is more connectivity among transportation modes, and I would love to have a fifth goal or maybe adding to the goals we have of connectivity to specific um, destinations. So we, um, you know, not, not just the T stations, but McDonald Park is right next to it. It's the largest park along the Mystic River um, and the Fells, Middlesex Fells. The other one. So opportunities for active transportation to the key destination points that are otherwise Just a point of information again, um, the city of Medford is actively working on design of a pedestrian underpass under Route 28 bridge that would mirror the Somerville side, just so, because not all the folks on the call might be aware of that. And that ties into this overall connectivity piece. It doesn't mean we should say, okay, that's done and not address it in the Wellington Circle, but it's good to know that that's also a part of what's going on. And um, as part of our Medford um, application for some grant money, we took the time and, um, and indicated how many lanes of traffic a pedestrian has to cross in Wellington Circle to get from one corner diagonally to the other. And it's upwards of 17 lanes of traffic that they have to cross. So. Hi, this is uh, Jay Monty. Sorry. I was just going to say, it looks like we have three raised hands um, on working group members. Uh, so I think it would be easiest if everyone just used the raised hand uh, tool and then we can uh, call on everyone. 
Yeah, I would just add in addition to the number of lanes that you have to cross, it's the number of separate signal phases that you have to wait for to make that crossing. All right, so the first raised hand I see is Brad Rawson. Thanks, Natalie. I've, I, I've spoken a couple of times. Why don't I, um, why don't you come back to me after other folks have had a chance to chime in? Okay. Um, next we have Charles Harnett. Yeah, so as um, I was going over this meeting, I kind of remember that we, so the city of Medford uses a uh, kind of a notification slash um, issue type uh, website, C Click Fix. And uh, I was able to print up a bunch of the uh, issues that we've had specifically with the Wellington Circle. So by all means, if, um, I mean, these are coming directly from citizens as well. So um, if you need me to share some of these, um, by all means, I can provide them to the uh, group. Yes, please. Um, Feng Young. Uh, hi, uh, I just want to share some like crash data information to everybody. So uh, I found out there is a RSA report online and on this location that back to uh, January 2011 to December 2013. In these three years, there is uh, there was totally 176 crashes. So uh, that's like 59 crashes per year. But um, so I went to master portal, crash portal, and I found out uh, from January 2016 to uh, 2020, this month, there, are, there is like a 513 crash, uh, crashes total. So that means uh, 108 crashes per year. So that's kind of like double the crash data from the old time, so so that's the information that I want to share. Thank you, uh, Jay Monty. You're next. Yes. Yeah, so um, Brad Rosson and I had the privilege of being on the Lower Mystic um, Working Group, uh, which uh, really we came out of a similar desire to fix Sullivan Square, um, and I think what came out of that study was the realization that this is not, you know, these issues are not specific to Sullivan. They, they reach their, their reach is very broad. It goes, you know, miles um, across many communities. And I just want to make sure that this study, I think, takes, it, it may not have the same resources as that study did, um, but I think the reach of the problems in Wellington are, like Sullivan, um, you know, much broader than just the Wellington Circle area. Um, and so I hope that this study will take that into consideration. I think other have, have spoken as well, um, but it really boils to um, you know regional travel demand patterns, uh, regional transit issues, uh, regional bike ped. So I hope that this study does take that into account and go beyond simply the, the Wellington Circle area, as I'm envisioning a sort of maybe a you know in, in, in yard or mile, but this really this is um, a place that is is much more um, regional than that. Brad, we'll go back to you. Thanks, Natalie, and thanks everybody. I think this is just going to be a really good working group. It's, it's a pleasure to hear the perspectives that are being articulated already. Um, Fong had mentioned crash data, and I guess I would respectfully suggest that as we dig deeper into crash data, we make sure that we understand the severity of crashes. Our vulnerable road users, people walking, rolling, or on bikes involved in those crashes, if they are just motor vehicle crashes, is it one vehicle crashes? Um, you know, the city of Somerville has made a commitment to eliminating fatalities and severe injuries on our road system. And so one of the things that we learned from this international Vision Zero framework is that not all crashes are equal. And that in Somerville, we really work to control higher speed crashes and crashes that involve people walking, rolling, or on bikes. Um, so that's one little small suggestion for some of the key performance indicators. 
Um, Todd and Gary mentioned another one that triggered a thought for me, which is the idea of crossing 17 lanes of motor vehicle travel to reach your destination. Um, the industry as a whole has worked on a, a level of service kind of equivalent, which is called level of traffic stress or level of travel stress. And it primarily focuses on people walking, rolling, or biking. Um, and so I, you know, I, I understand that the Mass DOT team and the McMahon team uh, will have this same perspective of making sure that we think about the user experience, uh, the level of comfort, and the level of travel stress. Peter Firth, the uh, renowned professor from Northeastern University, has actually been a you know, global pioneer in these metrics, and we've used it successfully in many local initiatives recently. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to say, if it's okay, is uh, Todd and Jay both acknowledged, and Julie as well, some of the great improvements that have been made. Uh, McDonald Park is one of my favorite places to go. I live in the Mystic River Basin and take my young son over there all the time. And the DCR has invested in the Pathway Network. The DCR has recently also invested in big buffered bike lanes on the Fells Way, north of the study area. Todd acknowledged the partnership that the City of Medford and the City of Somerville have engaged in with MassDOT to transform the Wellington Bridge into a safer, more inviting and COVID compliant place for people to move and to enjoy the Mystic River resources. I'm gonna be really interested to learn from you all and make sure that the study team is accounting for all of these improvements that we have all been engaged in and how that influences our base existing conditions data and then the kind of projections and modeled conditions going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Uh, it looks like Bill Carson has his hand raised. Bill, you're on mute. Good. I think I'm unmuted now. Yep. Uh, first thing I want to say is in my role as representative of the Ninth Street Coalition, uh, the term uh, pedestrian uh, connectivity, mobility, and all that uh, doesn't seem to really address the issue that's most important to us, which is the people coming off of Route 16 and trying to avoid traffic in the circle are going down 9th Street to avoid the circle. And when I think pedestrian, I think a four or five year old kid on a tricycle. I think myself um taking a morning walk and not paying a lot of attention to what ought to be slow moving traffic as somebody blasts down the road at 40 miles an hour attempting to get to work you sort of get the gist of what i'm saying so we've got pedestrian safety in the circle and then we've got safety for people on all the streets in the vicinity uh, the second point, which we've never discussed in the 9th Street Coalition, but it's a big thing for me, which is that bicycles and pedestrians don't mix much better than pedestrians and cars do. Uh, a bicycle moving 10 or 15 miles per hour is a lethal object. Uh, and so I'm a big advocate for separating walkways and bicycle lanes. It allows the bicycles to move at the comfortable speed for them, and it allows the pedestrians to not have to constantly look around to protect themselves from bicycles. That's, those are my comments. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it looks like Todd Blake, you have your hand raised. You can speak now. Just to add another project and give some context, um, there was a couple of recent projects that have been completed. The Woods Memorial Bridge project, the state project, did some improvements. And then also Wynn Casino did some short-term improvements that you know, added to some of the confusion in Wellington Circle for a while. Um, and that the Woods Memorial Bridge project is an example of, it had a lot of good improvements, but then there may have been some side effects that may have been a little negative. For instance, for Brainerd Ave, uh, it's more of a lessons learned thing. So um, for Brainerd Ave, it provides, they recently added a traffic island over there as part of that project, right where the limits of that end and kind of where this begins. And um, it added the benefit of safety getting out of Brainerd Ave, 
but it also resulted in some negative uh, impacts for vehicles having to turn onto Brainerd Ave that wouldn't necessarily have had to in the past. So it's just something to keep in mind when we move forward with this. Doug Carr? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm really excited to explore some of these uh, concepts that we're gonna look, be looking at. I would just say that I think there's a, a great opportunity here. This, this intersection feels like it's been frozen in time for about 1980, you know, it doesn't, it seems like the, the pattern we're seeing on all these type of places is much greater improvement um, in terms of pedestrian and bike and, and other experiences and still making cars work. This, this intersection feels like a throwback in time, you know, that we need to kind of catch it up to the rest of the, rest of the city, the rest of the region that's happening. I just note that the, uh, the little logo that you guys put on the upper right hand corner of the draft goals, I think is kind of an interesting uh, party of kind of a challenge. It looks like about three or four different paper clips kind of jammed together, which is exactly what that road feels like in terms of the kind of messiness and lack of clarity. And I think there's, um, I'm sure we can get, come up with an opportunity. I served on the Green Line extension with several people on this call uh, the, uh, the working group there. So there's a, there's a, this, I'm very excited because this is a, a good group. There's a lot of great opinions here and a lot of, a lot of depth of experience, which I'm excited about. Thank you, Doug. Are there any other comments at this time for any of the working group members? Feel free to raise your, virtually raise your hand. And are there, we talked about a little bit about this at the start of the conversation, but are there any other changes that you would make to any of these goals and objectives? Uh, we have Jay with his hand up. Yeah, sorry, I just wanna, and this may, I may miss if it was said, do you know if you're going to be able to send us a list of everyone that's in the working group so we all know who each other are and what organizations we belong to? Yes, we can circulate a list. That would be great. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, edits to any of the goals, objectives, the uh, preliminary evaluation criteria? And it's certainly okay to not have any thoughts now. We'll certainly share this presentation with everyone so you have time to further review and send any comments that you might have after today's meeting. So I think at this time, um, we can go to the study schedule slide. So this graphic shows the study process over the next year with the anticipated months for our working group meetings, our public meetings, as well as the pop-up events. And as soon as any of these meetings or events have been scheduled, our study team will send out emails so that you'll, you'll know exactly when these are. And before we get into the next steps of the process, are there any questions on the schedule? Uh, Todd Blake. 
Hi, looking at that last graphic quickly, the I just wanted to ask about the definition of the study area. Does that fall into that first orange box here? Yes. Because I think some folks had mentioned comments about the graphic that was shown for intersection evaluations and that some folks had mentioned it's more of a regional quarter. So um, I don't know if it was this meeting or another meeting that would have that conversation about um, defining where exactly the study limits are. Yeah, that's definitely a conversation um, for today's meeting and you know after the meeting as well. Um, we definitely want to get your thoughts on the local um, study area as well as the regional study area. So if anyone has any comments or questions on that now, we can certainly talk about it and answer now. Or if you know you want to review the presentation after this meeting, certainly send us questions or comments. Yeah, we can certainly take comments after and it. You know, we've, we've heard some, the, the ninth and Brainerd comments. Uh, if there's other specific locations that are, you know, real concern, locally, make sure that, you know, we hear about them and that we're able to include those um, in our evaluation. See Bill's hand raised. From my point of view, the Wellington Circle includes, I don't view this regionally, I view this as the circle. It starts with the entrances and exits from Wellington Station in that direction. It goes down to Assembly Square and it goes to the west uh, past the shopping center uh, entrances and exits. So basically all the local traffic in the vicinity has to be thought about as a single integrated area. And I believe we have all of those locations included in what we'll be looking at locally. We have a raised hand from Doug Carr. Yes, just a quick, quick question. I, I'm sure there have been several previous studies of this circle in the past. Um, are they available? Do you have, are they part of this project to evaluate what's been looked at in the past? We'll, we'll go back and revisit those. I think, you know, at least in my experience, the the environment has changed in terms of what the goals and criteria would be for what what makes a successful project so you know we'll look at them they, they can be informative um but you know a lot of times the the methodologies the changes in traffic patterns and volumes and priorities make them um you know a little outdated so that we we, we can't really take them and build directly off them, but we certainly use them for background information and such. Todd Blake. Yeah, sorry to hog the mic here. Um, I wanted to um, make sure that in the intersection, in the graphic that showed the study area and it showed circles around intersections, I wanted to hopefully clarify to some of the folks that are on the Medford Working Group that just because the circle isn't over your particular thing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not in the area, but we should be cognizant of, um, of being aware of specifics that aren't circled and how we move forward with evaluating those impacts. So what comes to mind is the ninth of brand, but also the driveway curb cuts for a lot of businesses at several corners. We wanna be sensitive to them. You know, we wanna improve all the things that we've said, but we wanna also be cognizant and sensitive to them and somehow come up with that criteria other than level of service at each driveway to evaluate if it's positive or negative in the trade-offs and balance. Yeah, and, and you know, we could have circled every driveway. We'd have a lot of circles out there, um, but we certainly consider you know, the access to the individual parcels and how those are gonna be affected by changes, proximity to intersections, sight lines, safety. Um, that's certainly part of what we'll be evaluating. Jay Monty. I'll add my two cents to the um, 
study area here. I, I don't think this is part of the direct study area, but I do think it's something that should be at least on the periphery and acknowledged um, somewhat, which is the Santilli traffic circle um, to the east of Wellington. So even though it's not, you know, I would argue it's a direct um, impact of Wellington, uh, there are certainly connectivity issues between there and Wellington uh, for transit, for bike and ped. And if this product does, you know, get to the point where it is increasing the vehicle throughput of this intersection in Wellington to, you know, reduce traffic congestion, uh, that intersection, you know, like um, those intersections going west are going to feel the impacts of that. They're already, you know, Santilli is already um, pretty congested and constrained. Um, so I just, I, 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 I caution that, um, you know, even though maybe not part of the direct study area, this should be sort of um, considered on the periphery that um, things we do in Wellington will affect that next downstream um, intersection. Yeah, and as I talked about in the regional study area, we'll certainly be looking at Santilli, Santilli and beyond uh, in all directions. One of the things I didn't mention, you know, one of the newer tools that's available to us is looking at the users of the circle. Uh, there's a lot of location-based data that comes from mobile devices, you know, GPS systems and the like that we'll have access to as part of this project. So we'll know you know, the folks that are going through the area, are they local? Are they, you know, long distance trips? Um, you know, what, where are, are they coming through Santilli? Are they coming from the north? We'll have a lot of that information. Um, that's, it's really been a powerful tool uh, that's become available to us recently um, through some of that, that big data uh, sources. So, you know, we'll, we'll have some, some pretty interesting information and some useful information on how folks are using it you know, who's using it, where are they coming from, that we think will be really informative in the process. Thanks, Gary. So I don't see any other hand, virtual raised hand. So I think we can go to the next step slide. Thank you. So for the next steps, based on today's conversation, we'll be finalizing some of the items presented today. Of course, um, if you didn't have time to, um, ex if you didn't express any of your thoughts or questions uh, in this meeting, you can certainly uh, share comments with us after, take time to review the materials that are presented today and let us know. So then we'll be finalizing the items from today and start working on the analyses in task two. So then we'll reconvene in the fall to share those findings with the group and get your thoughts. So as we wrapped it up today, thank you again for joining us. The meeting materials along with this video recording will be available on the study webpage. And we encourage you to uh, visit the comment form on the study landing page if you have any comments or questions and to sign up for the study's mailing list. So at this time, since we have a lot of time left, if any of the meeting uh, attendees uh, have any comments or questions that they'd like to share, um, feel free to um, enter your comments in the chat box or raise the virtual hand. Looks like we have a hand raised from Amanda Lineham. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself briefly because I think I was um, initially brought in as with a public link instead of a participant link. And I um, just wanted to say hi to everyone. I'm Amanda Linehan. I'm a city councilor in Malden, longtime commuter through Wellington uh, via every mode you can possibly imagine. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this. I've you know been watching and listening and this sounds great and I'm really eager to get started. I think one of my Council colleagues is also on the call, but looks like they may be in as a um, as the kind of webinar participant instead of on the official side as well. So I just wanted to flag that Councilor Winslow, I think, is here and he's been adding some really helpful comments in the Q and A. And then I think our city engineer is also hoping to join, but couldn't be here for the beginning today. Thank you, uh, Bill Carson. I apologize for not being very Zoom adept. 
Anyhow, uh, just in listening to the previous comments and seeing the map again, uh, I want to be sure that dedicated bus lanes are under consideration. Uh, I'm not sure whether I even advocate them, but uh, and that becomes significant when you look at the circle around the area. Uh, it does not include assembly and perhaps equally significant, it doesn't include Sullivan. And the bus uh, routes that involve Wellington and Sullivan are key to the whole regional transportation system. And so in terms of improving the efficiency or the speed of public transportation in this region, uh, allowing the buses to move between Wellington and Sullivan uh, more efficiently, more expeditiously might be a big step. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Brad? Um, again, I just want to, you know, thank Bill for raising that issue um, and for, you know, point of fact that may be helpful for all parties on the call. Um, some of the before and after indicators that the city of Somerville measured after installing dedicated bus lanes on the Winter Hill Corridor Broadway serving Route 101 and Route 89 last year indicated that before COVID changed everything, we saw a 36% increase in bus ridership associated with the reliability, runtime, and kind of dignity benefits of providing the, the dedicated space for people riding buses in our community. And I think some similar impressive numbers have come out of Jay's important work in the city of Everett, uh, the city of Boston as well. And it's part of the reason that Todd uh, and I have been so excited about the Mystic Avenue corridor that the two cities have partnered on uh, recently for Route 95. So I'm glad that topic came up and we look forward to digging into that and sharing our experiences if it is helpful. That would definitely be helpful. Thank you so much, Brad. So are there any final questions or comments before we wrap up today's meeting? Seeing none, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We appreciate your feedback and your thoughts today. Um, again, feel free to contact with us with any questions or comments as you continue thinking about what was presented today. All right, thank you so much. Look forward to working with you throughout the study process.